Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, we welcome you to the Department of uh, Communication and Journalism in Usmania University, Hyderabad. Uh, we have a guest with us, uh, Professor Kaushar J. Azam, professor. Uh, she is a very senior professor. We, we welcome you to our department, ma'am. She is now uh, Professor Emeritus attached to the Usmania University uh, Center for International uh, Programs as an advisor, programs and development. Once again, welcome, Professor Azam. Thank you. Uh, the topic that we have uh, chosen because we thought it would be appropriate given the times we live in and uh, given the uh, given the tectonic shifts in yes. international affairs is uh, impact of uh, US elections on South Asia. So let's begin the discussion. Uh, we'll start with a, your view on the perceived changes in the US foreign policy with the election of the new president elect Donald Trump, especially with a special focus on South Asia and India. Well, uh, since the election results have been announced, so many articles have been written where people are speculating about the possible changes in American foreign policy uh, towards the entire world as well as to South Asia also. Most of us in South Asia, particularly India, are, are concerned about the direct implication for our people, that is your immigration. And uh, Trump has been on record of criticizing immigrants and the immigration policy. He has been particularly critical of the immigration from Mexico and other parts of the country, uh, other parts of the world, particularly the non-Western world. And uh, he feels that the immigration policy has been too soft for certain for the immigrants of certain countries, including India. So that might affect uh, the immigration policy and affect our younger people who are aspiring to go to US. Um, one thing that uh, we saw because the whole world follows the mm -hmm. US elections are uh, certain rally cries, mm -hmm. uh, things like make America great again mm -hmm. and America first. Yes. So what do those, uh, although they are catered and tailored for the domestic audience, mm -hmm. but still uh, what does that mean for the rest of the world, let us say India? You see, the election announcements, so the pre-election promises of Donald Trump were made specifically for the consumption of the local audiences. Because it is the Americans who elect their presidents, not we who elect the American president. Now, to feel one's population great and interested in their leader, any potential leader will have to appeal to the populist element in their own country. And nobody can question the desire to become great, whether it's India or America. To make America great assumes that America was not great all these years. Or to make America great again assumes that the immediate predecessors were not doing enough to retain the greatness of America. On both counts, I think his message touched the hearts of the people who matter, and that's how he got elected. Make America great. Perhaps he is talking about greatness of America vis-a-vis -vis America's burdens towards the whole world. We will uh, try to move on to specific topics. Uh, let's say immigration, you touched upon that yes. in the earlier question also. Uh, specifically, we'll talk about immigration and uh, diaspora issues. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, prickly area mm -hmm. was in the campaign again. The candidate Trump talks about uh, Muslim entry ban into the country extreme vetting to regulate and restrict uh, Muslims from certain countries, not all, from entering the U.S. Now, India is a secular democracy. Uh, is there a response that India needs to have? You see, we, you, we, we need to make a distinction between the Muslims from the entire world and South Asian Muslims are Muslims from India going to America. What Trump has been harping on is the fact that terror invoking the name of Islam has played havoc with the peace in all the countries of the world, 
almost all the countries of the world who matter, not every country. And as a recipient of the terror attacks, both India and America have tales to share, have concerns to talk about. Now, when he talks about Muslim immigration to America, he's also talking about those Muslims from the Middle East who went to the European universities, who were technologically very savvy, who were the first um, people uh, to have attacked America in, in 9-11. You remember those guys went from German universities to the universities of America. So uh, he wants to have a system where you could screen everybody who is wanting to come to America because of the refugee problem. Americas have not taken refugees, but Europe has taken refugees from a number of Muslim countries. And recent attacks in a different European countries, it was discovered that some of the individuals who were responsible for the terror acts also had a refugee status. So we have to understand the concern of the Americans uh, about peace and stability in their own country. That's one part of it. When you talk about Muslims from South Asia, other more than Trump, it was Osama bin Laden who sealed their fate. Because by doing what he did, he sealed the fate of all aspiring Muslim youth all over the world who were not into the terror business. So I don't think the American establishment is going against the Muslim students going into America to pursue higher studies. It's a different thing if they are being screened. And they were to have to be screened. And uh, that's good for that country, that's good for us. It's good for global security. It's good for global security too. As such, India, India it's no different from the rest of the South Asia in this regard. Most of the children or the young men and women who are pursuing higher studies in America come from major India. And within India is from our own state as such. Right. Basically, this part of the country. Of course, there are Bangladeshis. Of course, there are um, other countries, younger people. Yeah. So India should be concerned about their future, as India has to be concerned about the future of all the Indians as such. Right. So to that extent, yes. Um, another area was, uh, again, now with regard to diaspora, mm -hmm. Indian diaspora in the US and in general South Asian diaspora, is uh, there, were, there were a number of Indians who were vocally supportive, yes. especially well to do Indians who established themselves yes, in the US, who were uh, rooting for a Republican win. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the other side, you have a immigration, we are immigrants in that country, we have three million Indians there yes. who Originally, a generation ago, two generations ago, were not there. Now, uh, as is there a dichotomy between them being immigrants uh, and them supporting a protectionist uh, uh, sort of an agenda? I, I mean, like, is there a fragmentation within the Indian diaspora? No, no. I think let's let's not forget that America is a nation of immigrants. There was the original. Americans were only American Indians, or whom we call the Red Indians. So right from the early 17th century till today, it has been taking people into its own land as such. So America is essentially a nation of immigrants. Having said that, the diasporic Indians who are there in the United States of America, their interests are different from India's interests as a nation state. Because they are not, even though they are racially and anthropologically, they are Indians, they are Indian Americans, but they are American citizens. So their welfare is linked with the welfare of America. Their progress is linked with the progress of America as such. Well. And they are the shining example of America providing freedom to grow, to develop, to achieve. And that's how they are all. Most of them are very rich. They have uh, funded the Republican campaign, election campaign. They are big supporters of Donald Trump. And uh, the Indians in India may not agree with that diasporic Indians because our dreams are as varied as we ourselves are. Uh, 
uh, a follow-up to that is uh, there was a very there was a very familiar phrase uh, phrase that was coined political coinage uh, to Indians it's familiar. Abki uh, bar Trump Sarkar that came out in the campaign uh, for an active push for the Indian American votes. Uh, now, given that diaspora, their loyalty should lie, lay with the country of their uh, citizenship. Yes, of course. Of course. So, is there any tangible benefits that they can accrue with this support for a particular uh, party that they have? They are partaking in the wealth of America, in the creation of wealth for America, in the consumption of wealth of America. They are a part and parcel of American administration. And if they have supported Trump, they have very good reasons to support Trump because they also must have felt the impact of the earlier policies in their own respective business organizations and profession groups, etc. The other factor here is Modi's, Prime Minister Modi's emphasis on the use of goodwill from our diasporic communities spread all over the world to build a better relations between India and the country of where they are living. His recent visits to the United States of America and to many other parts of the world have emphasized one thing, that Indian diaspora anywhere in the world would be the bridge between India as a state and India's interest in the country where they reside. People to people. People to people. And then they can play a very constructive, a very positive role without being accused of being disloyal to America. So it is. If the goals are the same, if the developmental aspirations are the same, I see no reason why there should be a dichotomy. Still, there is one little uh, dichotomy that I can probably identify. Uh, they were in the, in the news coverage uh -huh. post elections, uh, hate crimes against Muslims, Sikhs, and uh, other uh, Asian ma minority groups. Yes. Uh, they've said that they've spiked, uh, and racism is a problem in US as much of the rest of the world, okay. but again, as far as Indians and South Asians are concerned, is it, that a concern? It has to be a concern. It has to be a concern because race matters in America's social life, which is beyond the gaze of people like us who go there as academics. Most of the most of us, when we talk about the United States of America, our stay is confined to big major cities, big universities. We never go and visit the Kala Handis of America. We never go and visit the underclass of America. We never go and visit the ghettos of America. So that's where the discontent has been there. And that's where racism operates. Now talking about the hate crimes, yes, it is there. Because of, in the wake of 9-11, a number of the Dalgis were attacked. And anyone with a beard is a suspect. But uh, having said that, there is always a room to correct a mistake if it has taken place. And it's not just against the Indians, it's against their own blacks. So you believe that America has the strength to overcome a racially polarized uh, sort America of American administration may not have the, uh, have the strength to bridge the gaps between the races. But racism exists in America because it's very visible. Here you can't make a distinction of between who is who in the subcontinent. But there you can make a distinction because of the color of the skin. And the color of the skin matters. And that is how the recent movement, the black, black lives matter. Black lives matter. So it's, it has been a long struggle. And I, it's an unending struggle. Um, one other uh, area of uh, interest for immigrants, immigration, especially Indian immigrants, mm -hmm. and within that, uh, people with uh, IT and those sorts of backgrounds yes. are the visa issues, which is a perennial cause for concern. It's a very perennial cause, because there has been this general perception that American jobs are going away to youngsters outside America. So, so that American companies have opened up their concerns outside America, they hire young men and women outside America, at a much cheaper cost, with greater proficiency and competence, and then they make money. They also save money on that. So the American youngsters will not 
the feeling is that the American youngsters are being denied those jobs. And that is what Hillary harped upon slightly, and that's what Trump is talking about. And um, he perhaps would continue the policy of imposing additional taxes on these companies who hire non-Americans and on their profits, etc. It will affect our children, it will affect our younger people. He was talking about uh, high paying jobs mm -hmm. being given to Americans mm -hmm. as opposed to say a uh, highly skilled uh, Indian or a Chinese worker who comes in. Uh, is it, are there enough people, Americans who are actually uh, capable to take up all the jobs that are available that it's a threat to the Indians? You Indian see Americans. American youngsters are also going through crisis times. Because of the military involvement of America and going there, a number of young men and women thought that that is an easy job to go. When I taught in the American universities, youngsters would come and say, oh, there is always a job for us, we can be drafted. So. But not everybody wants to go and fight. So most of the American youngsters are facing a kind of a struggle, which is a universal struggle for all youngsters all over. And this has happened because of the globalization. And there are causes beyond India and beyond America for this unrest among the younger people. The respective governments need to address that the sooner the better. And the other age old election plank of uh, outsourcing, Bangalore. Did. Okay. Uh, it didn't come out as much in this uh, election cycle because topics were a little more uh, uh, heated. But yeah, well, domestic issues came to the fore. Mm -hmm. But uh, is that again an uh, issue that can uh, be raked up by Donald Trump? Outsourcing of jobs because he's talking about getting jobs into the US. He's getting jobs into the US, but then let's not forget that a number of American youngsters are working in India and right. in, in our country. And if you just do a survey of our own companies, you will see, you'll find that a number of younger Americans are coming to, to India to do those jobs provided by the Indian companies also. So it's a two-way process. But it's not at the same scale. It's though. not at the same scale because our workforce is much larger right. and much more, I would be proudly saying, competent right. and used to this than the American youngsters were getting into that, perhaps. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's my feeling. Yes. Perfectly. Uh, if, uh, we, we can probably move on to another area, mm -hmm. a big area, which is the strategic uh, affairs, defense and the strategic areas. Uh, one of the areas uh, that Trump again, he, because he is the kind of person who will, uh, mm -hmm. according to himself, call spade a spade. So he says uh, NATO members should, uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization members uh, should pull their weight in the alliance. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was talking about uh, reviewing even U.S. membership into the NATO? You see, we need to go back to the origins of NATO. NATO is a product of the Cold War. And once Soviet Union disintegrated in 1891, the real rationale of NATO goes off the screen. Because North Atlantic Treaty Organization, even though it is called North Atlantic, they have taken liberties with the North Atlantic as a geographical concept as such. Yeah. So, it was basically Western Europe, then after the breakup of Soviet Union, the Eastern European countries joining. It is much expanded now. But once it is expanded, most of the countries of NATO, America has a commitment to these countries, and Americans inside America do not feel the need of continuing with that commitment anymore, because Soviet Union is no longer the kind of enemy, quote unquote, which it was perceived to be during the days of the Cold War as such. So I think to that extent, it looks rational as a person interested in international affairs uh, to understand America's concerns. Because America has to spend the money, it has to take care of their security, it has to take care of their defense and strategic considerations. What for? When there is no enemy out there. Because the enemy has disintegrated. Uh, another part which was uh, uh, 
given to Russia in the election cycle and the proximity of Trump to Russia. Mm -hmm. Again, this may be a political statement before the elections, mm -hmm. but people were talking about uh, Putin and uh, Trump not being too far, uh, pretty close on a number of issues. Uh, will that again undermine NATO, which is a sort of a counterweight to Russia and its allies? If Trump starts to move towards some of the positions that uh, Putin has. It's too fluid a time and a situation. But uh, it appears as if there will not be much enmity between the American president elect of the United States of America and Putin itself. Because the first congratulatory message has already gone. And uh, there is a certain discernible relaxation of tensions between the two countries. We have to wait and see. The, as you said, ma'am, the Cold War, Cold War uh, scenario, thing of the past, fading mm -hmm. away. What is coming up though is uh, things like ISIS. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Trump has talked a very uh, tough talk on uh, ISIS. how we will deal with ISIS and how Obama administration has failed uh, with regard yes. to ISIS. Now, well, first thing, uh, is it all talk or is there more to that? You see, no. I have been following those statements. The whole world, all right thinking people, personally speaking, want ISIS to be finished off because of all the kinds of things they have done. So does America. And Trump has said that that's the biggest danger. And nobody can disagree with him. How does he intend to go about that? He has not spelt out. He is yet to spell out what would be the policies to contain, kill, or eradicate this particular force as such. What, what is the action plan? Because he is known for action plans throughout his economic uh, financial ascendance. I'm sure he will have some. And uh, the follow up is do you foresee any role for India in such a fight against ISIS in any form? I see a major role for India in keeping India safe from terrorism. Terrorism perpetrated by ISIS is near our borders and perhaps is getting in. To that extent, India must be worried about ISIS. But the kind of action which Donald Trump is talking about of finishing it off and all that, we cannot afford that kind of an attitude because of basically geographical reasons as such. So we would, perhaps India would support and we need support from every country to fight terror. To fight ISIS, ISIS is very active in a certain region of the world. Most of the countries cannot send their own people to sit, go there and fight, except the Americans. And then you remember Barack Obama who said that I will not put American boots on the ground. I don't want my boys to come back as dead. In body bags. So unless the regional opponents of ISIS are strengthened, which America is trying to do, we cannot do much. Our concern is to see that our own youth are not uh, brainwashed by the elements which will draw them to ISIS as such. Because you touched upon terrorism, yes. I think, and our borders and our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. One other area of huge concern to India, and uh, we are very keen on what position the US takes on this issue, mm -hmm. is the you know the financial and the military support given to our neighbor Pakistan. Uh, and uh, uh, given the election and given the strong rhetoric on uh, Islamic terrorism, mm -hmm. particularly, you know, Donald Trump never mixed any words. Uh, he's talked about terrorism, he's talked about, talked about Islamic terrorism yes. as a phrase yes. instead of yes. uh, trying to be politically correct. You see, uh, we need to go back into history a little here. Because in 1989, Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. And when Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, Afghanistan that led to the creation of Taliban in Pakistan. And Taliban were created by active support of Pakistan and military 
monetary and military support of the United States of America. The Taliban themselves turned into kind of uh, the Taliban terror we all talk about. So they have evolved into a different entity by now. So when we talk about America's support to what was that question you asked? Uh, on the financial and military support. On the financial of and military support. They did America extended both financial and military support to to the Taliban element in, via the Pakistani government. Now, geographically, throughout the history of Pakistan, since its birth in 1947, America has helped Pakistan, particularly with the beginning of the 1954 treaty between US and Pakistan itself. That was the treaty which pushed us into the arms of former Soviet Union as well. But over a period of time, Pakistan has been one country where America has been denigrated, humiliated, insulted, very badly, but still they have been supporting Pakistan. And now perhaps reality will dawn. Every American president has said that Pakistan should not do it, we should we criticize it, but still the help continues, it keeps trickling. They have not yet declared Pakistan as a terrorist state in the United Nations General Assembly. Now once you declare a state as a terrorist state, then that gives you the power of imposing economic sanctions. And when you economic sanctions are implemented, then the country is choked. And it has to do something to suppress the terrorist uh, element in their respective countries. That action is yet to come from the Western world, from America. So whatever Trump might be saying about Pakistan, I see a very difficult trajectory for Americans to contain Pakistan in its effort to encourage terrorism as such. And uh, anything that, uh, because uh, anything Mr. Trump might uh, bring to the table that was not there in the U.S.-Pakistan relation? He has said that they have not been telling the truth and uh, the world has been fed with wrong information about terror groups and all that. I really have I see no such possibility unless he gives them an ultimatum. But uh, let's not forget that Pakistan is an independent sovereign country. It has its own lobbies in Washington, D.C. So they might work towards softening the stance of the new administration towards Pakistan as such. Um, another, another area, uh, the other neighbor that we have now is China. Now, Trump has clearly bashed on China from an economic point of view, from a strategic point of view, spheres of influence and such. Now, India's position, does it get enhanced uh, in any way in our, in our neighborhood, in the wider neighborhood in Asia, mm -hmm. uh, with Trump being uh, so clearly and uh, blatantly anti-China? You see, the, the power game in South Asia is becoming very interesting. China has interest in Pakistan in the Gilgit area. They have already given a, a road access to China in Gilgit. Now, look at the geopolitics and the geography of the whole region. What happens is, there is an entry point in South Asia, which is Karakoram Past and Gilgit. Now, that part is controlled by Pakistan. 1965 war, our armies had almost reached, but the agreement which we signed in Moscow with Ayub Khan and Mr. Lal, the late Mr. Lalbar Bishrastu, they were asked to vacate that and they had to give it back. Now, the link between Pakistan and China will remain alive, both to cause discomfort to India as well as to America. Because that's a small, that's a kind of an, a partnership which has been evolving over a period of time. And China does not seem to be willing to give up that option. Remember, China's opposition to declare who is this man, Masood Hazar or somebody, as a, as a, as a, as a terrorist. I mean, what interests, what is the need for China to protect Masood Hazar, I don't understand. But then they do that. Right. So, only to keep it as a, de as a deterrence to India's expansion. 
and the Pakistanis have gone on record that we need not have any deterrent against India's nuclear program because China is the biggest deterrent for us. They have, they have gone on record saying because of the Chinese program. Yes, sir. And uh, do you see a loosening of uh, whatever talking of as a string of pearls uh, with the new U.S. dispensation? You see, a string of pearls is a new name for an old concept. We used to talk about military alliances and calling it containment policy. That is, you contain the expansion of power of a given country by putting a number of regional military alliances around it. And like ANZUS, Australia, New Zealand, and United States, like NATO, like CENTO, like CIA. And Pakistan became part of CIA and CENTO. Now, after the end of Cold War, and China, because of the maritime expansion and the maritime ambitions of China as well as India, China has started a string of pearls policy. A string of pearls is again to contain the expansion of the other aspiring regional powers into the Indian Ocean and beyond. So technically, the two concepts have the same objective of containing the outsider from coming into your area. So string of pearls will not affect United States of America because nobody is challenging them in Pacific. And then nobody can challenge them anywhere else because they are far too far. We can probably now move on to some other areas like uh, we have a number of smaller neighborhoods in uh, smaller countries in South Asia. Okay. Uh, they look to India both grudgingly, come sometimes call us Big Brother in a pejorative manner, not mm -hmm. totally complimentary. Uh, but with you know, Trump, Donald mm -hmm. Trump has talked about uh, countries taking responsibilities for their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. yes. He's talked about Japan being uh, nuclearized mm -hmm. and uh, independent in security issues. Now, with that sort of a stance, uh, be it with Japan, be it with Saudi Arabia that mm -hmm. Trump has talked about, mm -hmm. extends to India with mm -hmm. respect to our smaller neighbors, no, not Pakistan and China. Uh, does that, does India gain in the bargain? You see, the concept of giving responsibility to the major country in the different region is again a old hat. You know, the concept of a regional power has always been there. And there were identified regional powers like Iran and Brazil and India and China and Nigeria and South Africa, Southern Africa as such. So when you talk about regional power taking up the responsibility, it assumes that that power has no dispute within its own neighbors. We are okay with all our neighbors except Pakistan. And look what happened recently to Sark. Because when we didn't go, the others also didn't go. For their own reasons. But India's absence meant that it is as good as not being there, the organization. So I think it's a statement of a reality which is acceptable. Now India being a regional power or a regional bully or a big brother is a matter of perception. It's a matter of perception because we cannot help our size. We cannot help our population. We cannot help our competence as such. Also, we cannot help bring back the concept of race, of being who we are. In every South Asian country, there is a small India. Southern Nepal, Bangladesh, and then Northern Sri Lanka, the, the Mahajar elements in Pakistan. So, like in every Central Asian Republic, there is a small Russia. In every other country, there is a small China. And that is how bigger countries willy nilly become a part of the other countries. Like there is America in the world and world in America. You cannot deny that. You cannot throw the world outside America, nor can you deny America from your daily life. So the size matters. Sometimes the size has to go along with compassion, along with understanding, which we are trying our best to do. So Prime Minister Modi did when he took the oath to the office. Two mm -hmm. aspects of trade, commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a perception, maybe false, but uh, looks like we have a return to the isolationist policy which US had in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. uh, this, after a number of decades, maybe a century of globalization, mm -hmm. at least the talk of uh, the Trump campaign, even to an extent uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign on the other side, uh, 
they were talking about protectionism, isolation, mm -hmm. uh, other other world events like the Brexit mm -hmm. and some of the elements that came out in Greece, mm -hmm. talking about uh, inward looking uh, economic policy. Yes. Now, Trump has actually uh, stood for that, mm -hmm. at least in the candidate Trump has stood for that. Uh, do you think it's just... President Trump will follow it. Exactly. So when we talk about the concept of isolationism and isolationism as a policy, we're being confused with the 19th century American isolationism policy. That was the outcome of the Monroe Doctrine. And then that doctrine had come into force because America did not want to get involved in the wars of Britain, basically. And then America was still a country moving towards growth and development. And they didn't want their economic development to be hampered by unnecessary alliances with countries outside their own domain. It was also to safeguard American interests in the Western Hemisphere, basically. That was the point. Now when Trump and Sanders and the others are talking about the need to isolate, the isolate America, or the need for isolationism as such, it's a different thing. Because this has to be traced to the whole movement of globalization as such. Because globalization brings America into your home and takes you into the American homes as such. It doesn't stop there. It, it percolates into the economic activities, it percolates into the financial arrangements, it percolates into the creation of jobs, filling of the jobs, uh, making the lives of the people better, etc. And since it has, it gives you a corridor to the world, it also brings the world inside your own domain, affecting your own people. And that is how, that has been the factor which has been felt very deeply by the Trump supporters. Because they have looked at the undereducated, blue collar, lower middle class white Americans which were hidden by the media as such because the media has always been projecting the successful, the glossy America with a sheen on it because America was like city of the hill. In America and an America with a sheen and it was not the America of the underclass, of the underprivileged, of the black unwed mother, of the black criminals, the black young boys and girls who are framed for petty crimes because they don't even have been taught what a crime is. So this downtrend which has been caused by the opening up of everything including markets and institutions has affected America and has affected, it's affecting our own country, it's affecting all the countries which are partaking in globalization. So that is where uh, the media neglected this America at the cost uh, and was busy projecting the richer America. Uh, I think I'll give you an indication because uh, it would be wrong for all of us to believe that everyone is rich and happy in America. They are as unhappy as people in our own country are. Most of them are as poor and maybe poorer as people in our own country are. So, uh, I was going through lots of comparisons and during the last 25 to 30 years there have been major changes, major, major changes which have been recorded by the research institutions for showing, um, you know, following the, the trajectory of growth in American institutions. For example, one in three, three Americans are dealing with a debt collector. Every third American is not the president, not the, the vice president, but perhaps they also, but every third American is supposed to be in debt. Seventy percent of the college students are in debt above the age of 18. 18 and 19, we still protect our children. We protect our children up to 24, 30 sometimes. But 18 and above, 70% of that population is in suffering from the educational debt. Educational debt. In the year 2015, 8,000, 8 lakh American families have 
filed for bankruptcy. Imagine 8,20,000 in one year itself filing for bankruptcy and that would mean how many lo jobs, lo jobs lost, how many livelihoods gone under, how many children without education roaming around and that's what happened. And then America went from being a country that strengthened its middle classes to a country that bets on its wealthiest people. There are some more figures which are very, very revealing and telling to explain the victory of Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton. And these are the figures which will listen of why the Americans voted for this man and for, not for the lady who was so sure to have been elected. Now, one of the first things that they did is that the Americans nowadays, they spend 13% less on food than what they were spending 25 years ago. They spent 46% less on clothing. They spent 48% less on appliances, like cell phones, computers, domestic, whatever. They spent 11% more on transport, even though everybody is supposed to be having a car. 57% more on shelter. The condition of homeless Americans is, is appalling. They sleep on the malls, they sleep on the stations, they sleep on the footpaths. 57% more on shelter, 100 more on health. And that is how Obama health care was such a big necessity, which perhaps Trump may not have pursued. 275% more on college education. And I'm sure our youngsters are far more luckier in India. In Osmania. Uh, in Osmania <laughs> and in India where most of the education is, education is subsidized as such. And one more figure, and which is really a challenge, 953% more on child care compared to what they were spending 25-30 years ago. Spend times almost. Yes, and the moment a, a well-to-do couple gets a child, they become poor because they have to spend that much on bringing up their child. It's in poverty. Raised in poverty, raised in poverty, and then when you talk about the family values and the family system, every Indian home has somebody to look after. It's a disappearing phenomenon, but they, they still have someone looking after our babies. In America, it costs money to have a baby and to see that that baby is taken care of. So if this is what is happening to the non-rich America, they are disgusted. They were disgusted with the Obama administration. They were disgusted because Obama said, be patient, be patient. They are not. This is a vote for discontent, vote of the discontent, and for someone who is promising a city on the hill. Well, I, I remember a speech by Mario Cuomo, the former uh, governor of New York. Mm -hmm. He contrasted uh, it being a city on a hill to uh, a tale of two cities. A tale of two cities. A tale of two cities. So, so in the sense that it is not just one America, not just one American experience, mm -hmm. but it's an uh, American dream as well as an American nightmare. So yes, it's an American dream and an American. There's a, there's a famous book by a writer, Edward Lutoff, The End of American Dream. It's a, it's a wonderful book where he says that America will become as poor. New York uh, airport would look as dirty as Calcutta airport, but no, Calcutta airport I'm so sure is much better looking, but that's not it. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, Extending the extending the conversation on the political aspects of America, mm -hmm. one uh, experience to a lot of Indians and the worldwide audience, yes. uh, as a as a product of news consumers, mm -hmm. uh, we've been misled. We've been misled about what conversations actually take place in America, what are the concerns of common everyday Americans, and uh, media uh, is supposed to be a mirror. To the society, and uh, they were talking for a long time about the liberal media yes. uh, being elitist and being yes. out of touch, and they've been, and that has that notion has been dismissed offhand for a number of years. Mm -hmm. But uh, with this happening, with not just Trump being elected, mm -hmm. the them taking the Republican Party taking control of the Senate as well mm -hmm. as the House. Yes, very easy, yes. very easy measure. So, so that, that, it's not just charisma of. Uh, leader, but it's a, it's probably a trend which is going in a particular direction, which the media has failed to capture or 
Willful ignorance, maybe not? I think media was dazzled by the sheen of the Hillary campaign because everything looked hanky dory and we all, most of the media barons and the uh, people connected with the media industry, they felt and they were not even, even a second thought to the possibility of Trump getting elected. The remote is not even in their remotest imagination when they think of that. But what had happened was that media misrepresented the needs of America. Media represented, went all out about the deeds of America, but not the misdeeds of America. Yeah. And then uh, the need of an ordinary American who is not a university professor, who is unemployed, who has four children to look after, and who has lost his job because of the recession. And there are millions and millions of like that. So they were the ones who escaped the attention of the media and the media reporting themselves. With the result that the world followed that, that argument which had the sheen of Hillary Clinton being the Secretary, former Secretary of State, and the entire Obama administration's achievements, yeah. and then we thought it will never happen. Yeah. And uh, it is not really the ideology or the charisma of Trump which has won him the presidency. It is the discontent of the neglected America which has put him in power. Yeah. It is the discontent of the neglected America. And then to remove the discontent, a leader will have to go back to the roots and glorify their roots. And that is, leads to what is known as the neo nationalism or exaggerated nationalism. That you are great, you are greater than the others. You are capable, you are more capable than the others. American exceptionalism. American exceptionalism is an entirely different concept. We are exceptional. We are no doubt America being exceptional. And that, that exceptionalism is available to you. That's what Trump said. It's a very good thing. And this is an outcome of a number of factors which have come in the fore because of the forces which have introduced the globalization. And you will see country after country electing the leader on the right. Okay. It has already happened in India. Right. It's happened in America. In the UK. It'll happen in, in UK. And it'll happen in any other many other democratic countries where the the local, the indigenous or the neglected Indian, American, British or somebody is the okay. And they will put back leaders who will be more reassuring yeah. and with whom they will be comfortable. These people will be comfortable. Mm -hmm. It is not the academics hero. Uh, Donald Trump is not the hero of the American academics as such. Right. or Indian academics for that matter, but he is the hero of the American in the class. That's, right. That's where he is. Mm -hmm. And we've also seen, because we are on the topic of media yes. broadly and politics, so we've also seen the pollsters getting it wrong. Uh, people who are uh, syphologists, yes. who do this, uh, it's their bread and butter. Mm -hmm. uh, inevitably, across the board, everyone got it wrong. Uh, even people who are supposedly unbiased and who do the stats and maps mm -hmm. on this, now, that is, is, is there a total disconnect with uh, what what we do? We have a gatekeeping role in media. Okay. Is the gate on some other component? I'll I, I put it this way. Media doesn't do election studies. Media reports. Yeah. Election studies are conducted by think tanks, psychologists, yeah. and then IMRB. Yeah. Kind of. In a recent program, Farid Zakaria, brought in two young Americans who are psychologists and who pointed out to him what went wrong with their election analysis. Okay. And they are the ones who gave all these figures, who said that this is what we neglected. This is, we were so, so obsessed, we were so dazzled by whatever was happening in America that we forgot to look behind and see what was happening behind us, what was happening right under the, under the light as such. Hindsight is 2020. <laughs> Uh, a, a comment also, ma'am, from you, with your experience of uh, what is the future? What does this hold for? Because that is the anxiety that we've seen. There have been a number of uh, protests in US. Mm -hmm. 
uh, yes. uh, not my president. Not, right. my president. not my president. Something has never happened before. Right. You see, people are going, there's nothing can be done. He is their president. He is the leader of the strongest country in the world. So he is a kind of a world leader. There is no disputing that fact. But having said that, whenever any leader or any agitator uses the language of extremism, he meets a moderate achievement. The extremism is, I'll stop all Muslims from coming into our country. The moderated version of that stance is, I will screen the Muslims who are coming into my country. He's already talked about it being a fence with Mexico instead of a wall. Uh, yes, the wall has become a fence, fence. and the fence will become screening and the screening will become legitimacy later. So these are the different stages. So when you say that I'm going to really fight with you and I'm going to attack that country, the, the language of extremism is used for the effect to send out a message, to, to wake up people to the need of giving attention to a reality. And once that is achieved, the leader uses the moderate terms which he has already used. Let's hope that some more some more reasonable voices are hired by him. Despite you don't believe it. As as of this week, we're talking about uh, mayor, former mayor uh, Giuliani being uh, secretary yes. of state. They were very, very close. Very close. And uh, coming back to our topic about the impacts on South Asia, specifically mm -hmm. India, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, Planning the change. Into the future projected uh, into the future. US-India relationship, even though we have always talked about democracy being more friendly to us, if you look into the facts and figures of our relationship with the United States of America, we have attained major successes during the regime of the Republicans. Having said that, in the past 20, 20 years easily, the, this relationship has attained a certain stability. And that stability is unlikely to be disturbed no matter Modi being in power or Trump in the, being in power. We can just introduce marginal changes regarding implementation, etc. Regarding the extent of quota, regarding the extent of intrusion or exclusion. But the basics will remain the same. So since he has not yet made any statement against India, about India, if at all he has made any positive statement, I don't see much many major changes taking place within, uh, in our relationship with the United States of America, except when he addresses the job seekers of his own country. For his own that will constituency. Need our, youngsters, our youngsters will have to bear the brunt of it. A comment on uh, uh, the similarities of uh, our own Prime Minister and uh, how do you see, is, is personal equation a big factor in these sorts of issues? Uh, Personal equation is a big factor, but when I don't think we can really compare Mr. Modi with uh, Trump. Mr. Modi has come from the grassroots. He, every uh, attainment of his has been a result of sheer hard work and sheer willpower. Hard work plus willpower plus sincerity and integrity and then step by step. Trump has been born in a rich family. He has never known poverty. And then he is the inheritor of a big empire and expanding his empire. The Trump Taj Mahal to everything. Modi has nothing. He has, he is the, he is lording over a, an American empire. So that is the basic difference because here he is a man of the people coming up to the top position. There is a man of the corporate world coming to the top position. And then Modi is basically a self-educated man. Self-educated man. And, um, Trump. I do not know about but, uh, Trump. Trump had a university, Trump University. Which Trump University, fine, and then he had a military stint briefly. And uh, Modi has, he knows the pulse of India, uh, being the chief minister of a major state. He knows the pulse of Indian politics. Trump does not know the pulse of American politics. He knows the pulse of the poor Americans. Because Modi coming from his background, would not be talking so freely to the corporate world because 
he has captured the understanding. So any day I would rate Modi at a much, much higher pedestal compared to Trump. You see that relation? Yes, Modi is being very, you see the there is a golden period between now and his taking of oath on 20th of January as said, of getting into the office. During these 30, 40, 50 days, Indian administration will need to reach out to the powers that will be in the U.S. administration to talk about H-1B visas, to talk about companies, to talk about the so-called unequal issues like nuclear power, etc. But uh, our Prime Minister is not highly preoccupied because of our own organization. And uh, even if he is not able to do that, I'm sure he will be achieving that once they meet face to face. I think, uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you. It's been very enlightening. And uh, I think uh, Professor Azam has uh, helped us understand a little of what happens in the US and how it affects not just India, South Asia, and the broader world. Um, hopefully, we'll keep this uh, as an ongoing conversation. We'll come back to this topic, and we'll uh, also uh, try to look at other areas which our department from time to time will uh, interview people, experts, to get a better sense of what's happening around us.